Okay, welcome back, everybody. Slowly going back from the coffee break. Um, I see already most of our speakers uh, here, so I would like to welcome them and also our moderator for the session today, Jan Chechela. I think we are at the moment we're only missing one speaker from Renaissance Institution. Victor should be. Oh, there is Victor. See, so nobody but missing anybody else. So with this, I would like to welcome the speakers, and then I will give the uh, the floor to Jan Chechele, the chair of the Fusion Student Council, who is going to be the moderator for this very interesting uh, session. Jan, please. Okay. Thank you very much, Dario. Uh, good morning, everybody, as well. Very, very grateful that so many of you joined us today. Uh, so after the rather comprehensive talk uh, about the scientific uh, endeavor in the European region uh, given to us by Mergio Fasoli. We will now have a final talk with uh, four representatives of both uh, companies. And in case of Peter, Peter Vondracek, a um, research institution, public research institution. And we will talk about the industrial aspect of, uh, of fusion. So kind, kind of look, um, from the other side at the at the uh, problems which you are trying to trying to tackle all together. So uh, without further ado, let me uh, introduce to you the panelists. Uh, so I will start um, as they are appearing on my screen. So <laughs> uh, first we have Petr Vondracek uh, from the Institute of Plasma Physics at Prague from Tokama Compass Upgrade, um, which is which is. Um, a public institution, but since the since the Tokamak is now under construction, there is a lot of uh, interaction with the industry going on. So that's that's why Petr is joining us today. Then we have uh, Jorit Leon from Proxima Fusion, a um, fusion startup, uh, uh, which is a um, spin-off from the Max Planck uh, Institute. Um, then Frederick Baudry from Gauss Fusion, also a fusion company. Hi. Um, which um, is a kind of, um, well, let's say, offshoot of several companies with a lot of experience in the nuclear sector, which kind of bent together to, um, to, to pursue fusion as well. I'm welcoming also Victor Prost uh, from Renaissance Fusion, uh, another fusion startup company hailing from, from Grenoble, France. Um, and that's, that's all the panelists for today. So we will start with a quick introduction from each of the each of the panelists. Um they will they will tell you something about themselves, about the company which they're representing. And then we will move on to a um structured debate following with a open discussion. So if any of you have uh, questions already, you can um either write them down and raise a hand, raise a hand again uh, afterwards or you can just directly write them to the chat and hopefully we will go through them through them all. Um, so, uh, I think we can, uh, start from the opposite direction this time. So, uh, Victor, please, uh, you can start, introduce, uh, Renaissance Fusion and yourself in about five minutes. Okay. All right. Well, hi everyone. So I'm Victor Prost. I'm a mechanical engineer by training, but here at Renaissance Fusion, I'm the group leader of nuclear systems engineering. And so Renaissance Fusion is a stellarator company and our aim is to build, a experimental stellarator reactor um, that will deliver electricity to the grid. But right now we're focused on uh, developing three core technologies that we think that will improve and enable us to simplify the construction and design of stellarators. Those three technologies are a wide HGS tape. So we're building a manufacturing line of uh, HGS material. The second technologies are liquid metal that we're gonna use as first wall. And so we are developing both the pump as well as the way to enable full coverage of the interior wall of the accelerator using a liquid metal. And the third technology is a simplified coil winding surface, a simplified accelerator coil manufacturing technique so that we're gonna use with the white HGS tape. So simplified coils instead of 3D complex structures that we can see on W7X, we're gonna have simple um, wide magnets on which we're going to do pattern circuit pattern just like electric um, circuit right now so we're going to laser engrave those hgs tape 
and those laser engraving will enable the complex magnetic field of the accelerators. So those three technologies that we're currently developing and demonstrating in the lab downstairs are the three technologies that we're going to use to demonstrate and build a accelerator reactor uh, as fast as possible. Maybe I was a bit too fast, so I'll just- No, 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 I was just, uh, no, <laughs> no, no, I missed the unmute button. Thank you very much uh, for, for your introduction. Uh, so next up, Frederick, please, uh, you can begin with your introduction as well, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Jan, for the floor. I propose to share some slide uh, to illustrate my, 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 my things, if you don't mind. Uh, I don't know, can you see my slides? Yes, perfectly. I will put in a, a slideshow. Okay, then good morning. I'm Frédéric Bondry. I did a, a long career as a, in, uh, at CERN in accelerator domain. I was the director of accelerator and technology at CERN. And now uh, I am uh, the CTO, chief Techn technology officer of Gauss Fusion from the 1st of July. Then uh, I will introduce you in a full slide Gauss Fusion and what is the initiative of Gauss Fusion. Mainly, I want to say that uh, Gauss Fusion is a, a, a startup company based on successful uh, uh, industry, uh, very well introduced in the large domain of uh, nuclear, but also accelerator and scientific domain. The main founders you can see here, I will introduce better later, about ISG Superconductor in Italy, Alcimec Alcan in France, Brooker Group in Germany, IDOM uh, Engineering Company in Spain, and Research Experiment in uh, Germany. And these are the founders uh, to, to build this company and to really based on this industry. And all the things is to work uh, with partnership with uh, uh, institution uh, as a CERN, uh, the Magnet, IPP, uh, KIT, NEA in Italy, Nuclear uh, University of Indovan, and more. We are discussing with more partnership with institution to do private public partnership. Uh, to, to, in a few words, we introduce the key uh, industrial players. As I said, Alcimex, Alcan, working in the uh, in tritium, working in a uh, lot of uh, nuclear fission domain, but also with ITER in uh, old fusion. IDOM is a main engineering company in Spain. IG, very well known supercomputing magnets uh, for different projects, scientific projects, but also with ITER in all the domain research instruments, mainly also about, about cryo technology, about RF, supercomputing RF. And Brooker, which is a leader of all what it is, NMR and uh, uh, MRI uh, things, and also giving superconducting wires. I know very well uh, Brooker because it furnished, for example, all the superconducting wires for the HLLG at CERN. The board, we have a board chaired by the CEO of Brooker, Frank Locken, and uh, having this board with all the representatives of this main industry, uh, large industry I, I, I introduced to you, plus other investor, and also have, uh, having a strategic and scientific advisory board with uh, eminent uh, experts coming from CERN, IPP, ITER, KIT, JET, CA, and so on. Okay, now to come back that what is our uh, philosophy is to capitalize on mature technology. We will innovate what is needed, but really to start what is existing and to from the core fusion specific component. And uh, we have different things, especially in magnets, in tritium, where we want to uh, innovate and we want to assemble to get the first uh, fusion power plant on the grid. Then we define the main domain where we want to, to, to work. As I said, it's a magnet, obviously materials in tritium within blanket. Knowing also we are working on the eating technology, especially ECRH with a Giratron to optimize this power needed for the it's a plasma. Okay, this is the organization of the Gauss fusion for time being in five domains, but it's a device domain to define the global FPP design. Now we we are discussing that and we tense we are looking at the difference between tokamak and the relator. And we, we will take a, uh, we will announce our final decision after the board the 15th of December in January uh, to uh, which technology we, we are choosing 
And I can say only today that we are tending to one stellarator. And we have a lot of fission breeding blanket, which is this is, is very important. It is crucial for fusion. And really, this is our key things about a uh, complete uh, fuel cycle with fission. Obviously, they mentioned materials, magnets. Uh, we have no religions. We are looking at magnets, LTS, and HTS to define this best uh, uh, possible uh, fusion power plant. And we are also looking at now site configuration. We are looking at different uh, uh, European country in uh, Germany, France, Italy, uh, also including Switzerland, Spain. What are the potential sites to have a five potential sites in our hands in two years and to do after that a selection where we will build our things with a discussion at the level of the government. As I said, we are now uh, doing uh, more and more industrial partners based on the five, the five uh, today, but we have a lot of discussion with the large groups and Thales, Air Liquid and so on to uh, do that and to do a public institute of lab. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to do this public partnership and only to do innovation and IP where it's needed. Our plan, a roadmap is in uh, uh, three phases. Uh, we are in the first phases to 23 to 25, but it is uh, really a conception design report. It will be finished at the deliverable conception design report. After that, phase two, which is the engineering uh, phase, uh, finishing with a technical design report where our goal is defined, testing uh, with a prototype, and after that, to push the button to do the construction. And you can see these phases, we are not we don't promise uh, the, for tomorrow because I think it's not reasonable. But we said the fusion with integrity. Then we said the phase one will be uh, over uh, three years, phase two of 2020, 20, 20, 30, 30, 32, 33. And after that, the final of construction will be ready uh, early uh, 14th. Okay, then I want to again that uh, we are uh, this uh, new company with uh, different subject and uh, is a leading European industry to build fusion power plants. And I want to say to the committee, we are hiring, then please look at our site. If you want to, to look at that, we are up, a lot of open posts possible for young, uh, young bright engineer, physicist, and, and technician. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, so next up, I will ask uh, Yuri to give us uh introduction of Proxima Fusion and himself as well. Yeah, thanks very much. First of all, also thanks for the invitation. Um, I originally didn't want to show slides, but now I do. <laughs> um, just a quick introduction to myself. Uh, I've done my PhD uh, at the IPP, the Max Planck Institute in Greifswald, um, working on stellarator reactors using systems codes. So uh, not Wendelstein 7X, so just Wendelstein 7X, which is a scientific experiment. But the topic of my PhD was to think about the step after Wendelstein 7X, how would we build a stellarator reactor? And um, after my PhD, I then co-founded Proxima Fusion together with uh, four other um, bright people, um, one of them from IPP, also from, from the Max Planck Institute, two from MIT and one from uh, Google X. And I'll just uh, share my screen real quick to also um, explain what we are, um, we're into. Um, so Proxima Fusion is a company that was founded in uh, um, January this year. Um, it's a comparably recent company. We are based in Munich and Germany, and um, we are pursuing the path of the QI accelerator, the current free accelerator, which is also what Wendelstein 7X is. And you all know that the race for fusion is on, right? And uh, we see a lot of like, um, investment in all kinds of uh, um, different technologies. However, like the, for us, most promising technology, which is this current free stellarator, uh, was not reflected uh, up to today, up to today um, with the Proxima Fusion. That's a concept that we are pursuing. And then we are convinced by the advantages of that concept, which is it's free of uh, disruptions that we would have in a tokamak. The densities are much higher or can be Around too much higher, the, the Greenwald density limit is not present in stellarators. 
the raters uh, give the advantage of have, having continuous power. Um, yeah, you don't have to uh, ramp up and down a central solenoid uh, in a, in a talker mark and you have like higher efficiency. So the lower reflect, you have lower recirculating power and uh, lower material fatigue. We're seeing ourselves as continuing the Wendelstein 7X path. Proxima Fusion is a spin out of the Wendelstein 7X Institute. And we are working in collaboration with this Institute on the path forward. Um, we distinguish ourselves maybe in the sense that we are like, uh, yeah, a spin out of this Institute. Uh, we are collaborating with this Institute. We are fixing the concept, um, but our technology agnostic, we're taking only the risks uh, that are needed, but we are taking risks. And we want to go uh, as fast as possible on that path. Um, this also brings us to aggressive timelines, which is our target. So this is really our philosophy: take the goal, uh, take the fix the concept, and um, have a goal that is aggressive. Uh, we need to be fast. We want to make an impact for climate change. We want to uh, build up the fusion industry uh, as fast as possible. That needs ambitious timelines. Um, so by 2031, we want to optimize, design, and build a net energy machine in until 2031. And by the end of the 2030s, which means towards uh, 2039, 2038, we are aiming for the for a first of a kind power plant. And here you see rough dimensions um, of our first um, simulation results. So we also see ourselves to be collaborating with industry and uh, academics. We're not trying to do this alone. Fusion will always be an ecosystem challenge and we're seeing, seeing ourselves to be part of it. Our approach is a simulation first approach. So we are convinced that we need to build up the simulation um, capabilities in order to find the best engineering design for a Stellarator. A uh, Stellarator is hard to design, easy to operate. So that is the, the thing that we need to nail at, in this period. So we are building a simulation platform right now, which we call Starfinder, um, which integrates physics and engineering constraints in one framework. Then uh, we were funded in January 2023 uh, with a pre-seed round, and we've been building up the team uh, from April 2023 to now November 2023 um, to about 18 people. Uh, some of them you see here. We are being advised by uh, the people that have built Wendelstein 7 x here in the middle you see uh, looks Egner and Felix Schauer, which is head of assembly of Wendelstein 7X and Felix Schauer uh, was lead uh, design engineer for Wendelstein 7X. Um, so we're taking the expertise of this Wendelstein 7X experiment also towards, uh, towards the next step. So then of course there was a big media echo as well. Uh, so we've been featured in many uh, newspaper articles and documentaries. And uh, that's my summary slide. So basically Proxima Fusion is doing this current free Stellarator as the most promising path together with uh, industry and academia. And uh, we are um, aiming for uh, building an excellent team and generating lots, lots of momentum. Looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you very much. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, we have Petr Vondracek. Uh, so please, you can start and begin your introduction. Thank you and good morning. Uh, so my name is Petr Vondracek. Uh, I would say I'm originally a plasma physicist, as I did my PhD in studying the heat fluxes in tokamaks using infrared thermography. But in last years, I moved more to project management and engineering, because I'm leading an engineering group here in Institute of Plasma Physics in Prague. Uh, we operated here uh, for 15 years, tokamak called Compass, and even before a smaller tokamak, Castor. And now for a couple of years, we are developing a new machine called Compass Upgrade, uh, which is a high field machine with uh, some aspects comparable to ITER in the meaning of uh, troidal field, for example, of five Tesla and so on. Uh, I can, for your reference, to show you an image of, of cross-section Compass U. So, here you can see a, a comparison with a standard man and four NBIs going into the plasma. Uh, you can 
hear more about CompassU later on today during one of the parallel talks, which will be given by Radomir Panik, our director. So he will tell you much more details on CompassU uh, shortly. We are kind of a typical national lab. Uh, so we are part of Eurofusion. We have uh, our focus mainly in plasma physics, but now with CompassU, we are moving a bit more to engineering and issues uh, relevant to, to power plants. The CompassU uniqueness is, for example, in a hot first of all, uh, 500 degrees C, and we would like to study liquid metals technology and, and stuff like that. So in this sense, we are moving more to engineering, but of course, the plasma physics and tokamak physics is the core of, of our research. So that's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, so now, um, maybe I'll just, uh, I'll kick start the discussion with a question directed towards you, Peter. Um, because you, with uh, the building of Compass Upgrades, which uh, maybe with the exception of DTT, but uh, in case of Compass Upgrade, the construction phase is a bit more advanced now. Uh, could you perhaps uh, tell us a bit about for example, maybe some 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 difficulties which you are facing with the uh, construction in relation to the to the industry, because uh, in case of uh, in case of fusion, in case of construction of uh, both tokamak, stellators, uh, whatever technology it may be, we are talking more or less always about very high tech, very top notch, never seen before technologies. Uh, so, so do you see some? Um, you can you can uh, I guess focus on good example good examples and bad examples of uh, what you faced with the relation to 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 the, to the industrial sector. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, you know we are just in the uh, in the time when we are tendering several major components of the machine. We should be signing a contract for support structure in in next month. So this is for example something like two hundred tons stainless steel structure bolted from many different components so uh and and in another uh, area for example power supply system this is something which was manufactured already and we are installing it now already already so we have quite some experience with communication with companies manufacturing and so on uh, what we are used to is that we have always quite long preliminary consultation phase with different companies on all the systems so there we always you know face somehow the reality that we designed something or we would like to have something from the point of view of plasma physicists and then we see what's possible and what is not uh, to make uh, by the industrial partners uh you know uh for example, the support structure, it's not such a big issue. There are many companies who are willing and able to, to produce that. Much more complicated it is with, with coils, for example. In our case, we do not have or will not have super conductive coils. We will have uh, copper coils cooled to cryo temperatures. So this is something uh, the companies are not so much used to because there are quite few companies who are delivering for ITER uh, superconductive coils and maybe then for DTT and so on, but cryocooled copper machine was FTU, which was built many decades ago, and it's uh, shut down already. Then uh, CMOD in the US, which is also uh, was shut, shut down. So uh, this is something not so so usual, quite special. So we are fighting with, with some obstacles with that. Uh, but uh, otherwise, uh, what we... Our experience this is that uh, the companies are very interested in uh, working for Fusion and with Fusion Labs because the market is growing. So, for example, the support structure will be most probably manufactured by a company uh, which was not focused on Fusion industry at all. They did, I think, two maybe Fusion projects in past year, and now they want to grow in this area. So this is quite typical that some of the companies are well established in the field, but many more are, are coming into the field. So this is something which is helping a lot to us. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, just just um, to, to, to the panelist, if you have uh, after after any any um, talk, uh, if you want to just, just to add anything, just 
please you're more than welcome to otherwise i'm just gonna keep asking questions <laughs> um and then then we will open open the discussion so so nothing to to add to what better just said right now okay good uh so so better better um mentioned it uh to, to some extent that we have um we have uh, companies which were not specifically focused on fusion now coming into into the into the field uh but i guess it can be done in the other way around as well because uh, a lot of the new technologies are being developed specifically for fusion uh i i guess the the prime example would be the high temperature superconductors uh because uh, as far as my knowledge goes most of the money which is spent on on this kind of research is spent by manner dedicated to fusion uh so perhaps v victor you're at uh, renaissance fusion you're focusing on uh, on these technologies as well uh could you could you tell us a bit about um um about this no yeah. so I, I agree that for example for high temperature superconductors um, the industry you know, is, is trying to increase the amount um, of, of high temperature superconductors that they're producing. But right now, they're very much lagging behind. Um, just as an example, we, we are ordering um, you know, three kilometers of HTS tape uh, to build a, a one meter bore magnet. And uh, you know, out of all the, the manufacturers, most of them had a lead time of, of a year or more. Um, to you know, manufacture and deliver the, the HTS tape. And so that shows that you know, the, there's, a, there's a need for ramping up and scaling up uh, you know, industry support and production for, for critical technologies. And that's also a reason why uh, we think that um, building up ourselves, um, our own HTS manufacturing line will be crucial, uh, as I say, in, in the race for, for superconducting uh, reactors. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, yeah. So, and I guess I guess uh, that also um, comes back to the to what Peter said that the continuity is crucial. Uh, because even if you develop so such a such a technology, such production, when you lose the lose the demands and just uh, stop the production, it's very hard to to come come back to it again. I guess right. Yeah. Um, right. So. Um, and um, uh, maybe I can uh, also have a question to 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 Frederick directed because um, we are also talking we're, well we we're, we're talking about new technologies but uh, you specifically in Gauss Fusion try to rely on already existing technologies so um, do you do you think that um, or, or well let's say let's say how big do you think the the impact of uh, of these technologies coming from accelerator physics or uh, I guess fission industry as well can be to, to fusion because um, some of the problems which we are facing, for example, related to neutron damage are kind of just just a more uh, enhanced uh, problem of uh, some previous technologies, but some, some of the others are just completely new. So do you think the uh, already acquired knowledge can also benefit the the fusion industry and the fusion community in in general as well in like tackling the completely new problems which you, we are facing and probably the most important ones as well. Thank you for the question, Jan. Uh, first of all, I want to say maybe a miss during twelve years I was in a chair of the collaboration between CERN and ITER because CERN and ITER we are sharing a lot of. Uh, same technology, especially in supercritical wire, uh, supercritical uh, magnet, supercritical wire, because we were uh, the lab testing the, the wire, the, the supercritical wire for ITER in terms of vacuum, in terms of uh, uh, RF, and so on. And I think we are sharing, I think we are sharing between high energy physics, what is pushing the technology and fusion a lot of things. Obviously, materials is one of them. But I, I, what I want to say is that it's true that we have not to reopen new fronts in fusion. I think there was a lot of work was done in the previous years, in pre previous decades. We have to capitalize on that. Obviously, there is some technology we have, what we, where we have to de develop, where we have to have new uh, IP and so on. And exactly, there's a strategy to look at what is existing, not to open new front, what is not necessary, and to focus only where it is needed to put R&D and so on to be as fast as possible. 
I'm thinking is exactly the strategy and, and not to have also religions. I just speak about the LTS, HTS. I think definitely HTS it could be the future. The main problem is the supply chain. This was mentioned by Victor. I think now we are speaking about kilos for HTS when we are not speaking tons for LTS and we have to be, and I know by experience that our slow was to develop LTS, Nabium Titanium, Nabium Sweetin, uh, from 100 kilo to 10 or 100 tons, this is a long process. Then we have not to, you have to be active to prepare the thing to use the two. HTS could be a good thing, not only for high field, but also for high density of current for marginal temperature. Then we have to be aware you have to follow that, but you have to have a basic known technology to start. And I think this is a compromise we have to look at what is the existing technology where you have to start and to, to, to build your uh, fusion power plant and where you have to focus to increase the things. And I think once again, I said in magnets, the wire is okay. We have to look at more magnet design, demontable coal, for example, is one technology we are looking. And we are in, in I think the key things is about materials and tritium. Tritium for me, if we are, we are not serious in a company, if we are not looking the completed fuel cycle of tritium, uh, for uh, FPP, you don't you don't want to dream a, a fusion power plant connected on the grid must have a close uh, fuel cycle with tritium, and this is really the key uh, thing for fusion. I hope I answer to your question. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, so when also when we are talking about the fusion industry, um, over over the past uh, let's say let's say almost almost 70, 80 years is it now, uh, since the fusion research started. So in, in the beginning, it was just a purely academic uh, academic field, but we are slowly moving towards more and more research and uh, work being done by the by the engineers, by the industrial sector, and basically basically private money in, in, in general. Uh, and in that regard, I think that uh, it's still maybe quite some time before the uh, before the bulk of the work is done by 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 companies by the industry, and uh, in in that regard, I think that the partnership between the public and private institutions, the companies and the institutes is is quite quite important. Uh, so so this leads me to to, to a question directed to Yorit, uh, because a um, a a spin off company from from an institute is is, is basically the standards of um, how you transfer the new some new technologies which you discover uh, into into a um, industrial um, application or let's say let's say a real time application of it. So do you, do you think this is still going to be the case uh, in the let's say foreseeable future before we see any any real fusion fusion power plants? Or do you think that um, there might be some changes in how the system works? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, so first, let me clarify that Proxima Fusion is a, we call it a spin out, not a spin off. Um, so like an uh, employee uh, spin out of people gathering from these institutes. Um, but yeah, I agree. Uh, I think that's the perfect uh, symbiosis uh, because like you are matching the, the expertise from the public institutions with the speed and this really directed drive of a, of the private private sector. I think if I understand it correctly, your your question was if this is like uh, also um, a vision for the first power plant. Is that correct? Oh uh, yeah, I, I, I guess you, you you can you can understand the question like that. I, I meant it okay. more generally, but I guess you can focus on on, on yeah right. I, I see that as a as a promising concept. Yes. Um, uh, specifically because like lots of this uh, fundamental understanding. Um, that also uh, needs to be done, and especially when we talk about fast, uh, fast particle physics and so on, uh, I see that on the plate of the public institutions, of the research in research institutions, to develop the level of understanding that we require for a fusion power plant. Then the private sectors I see more in the engineering and design aspects, uh, like bringing the concept to a level where we actually can build this, and also like the building process uh, I see on the on the plate of the of the private institution uh, the private uh, the private sector but i yeah um 
I see no reason that there's like should be one point where we say, okay, now it doesn't make sense to uh, pursue these uh, this split anymore. I see that as a very fruitful thing, actually. Yeah. Yeah, because it can it can bring uh, some opportunities to the to the part to the mother institution as as well, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so uh, I have an, uh, one last question before we open the uh, the discussion to the to the audience, uh, because we are here with uh, master students mostly. I guess guess the I, I guess most of the students are master students, uh, and so so this leads me to to a question because we are also we should also discuss the opportunities for for the for the audience. Um, so. And and this is a question directed to everybody. So if you have uh, if you have anything to 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 add, just just feel free to feel free to uh, feel free to talk. Um, so do you think that uh, the possibility of writing, for example, a master thesis or just work on a PhD or so, something like do the part of the study at a private company? Uh, do you do you think that this is uh, something which we will see more in the future? Because I know that I know some people who actually do their thesis at private companies. Uh, do you do you think we will see this uh, more? And the other question is that a lot of the master students now are uh, obviously thinking about whether they should pursue the pursue their PhD after they finish the master thesis. Um, because we are moving more and more to like so solutions and solving the engineering problems in in fusion i guess there might be a more uh, there might be more room for non phd educated experts in the in the field as well do you, do you agree with this or do do you think that most of the work uh, will still be done by by uh by phd's so anyone i can i can start if you want to yeah, yeah perfect i think we, i would say we we need both i think we we, we, we it will be a, one of the challenges of fusion uh, in the future is training, is to have new young people in the game. This will be, a, we, are, we are all are fighting to have good experts in all the domain we already mentioned, magnet, tritium, materials, uh, design, global design. Definitely, uh, we have a lot of specialists coming from institute. I think the last 30, 50 years uh, uh, is a very, Tremendous work was done in different institutions for fusion, big progress. We, we, we are now able to do this company because we had that. Then we will still need some contribution from this institute, from PhD, but we will need engineer. Now more and more we need engineer to implement the things. And we have to have this coordination between engineer and PhD. And for young people, if you are really in the domain of research, you want to do research, do a PhD because when you have, you have to do a PhD at the beginning of your career, do that. But we will need in the future also engineer. I, I am myself by, by education, uh, electrical engineer, I did a PhD. But I think we, we need this kind of uh, uh, people having this uh, uh, education in physics, uh, in materials uh, and engineering. And we will do that. And I think we, and anyway, our company, we are sharing PhD, but we need an uh, institution because the PhD title is, the, is given only with the university. And I think it's very good uh, things when we have a, a, a co-direction of a PhD with uh, an, an institution, an university institution, and with a company. And this, uh, we are, I did a lot in my, my previous experience, and this is a very good thing for the future. But my message, we need to train people in all the things engineer and physicist okay so I, I guess no much more no matter what you do with your studies you can always uh be sure that you will find a job in the in the sector <laughs> okay um can i, you can I, add, can, sure, yeah, sure. Can I add, add one point um i think it's not just education people can also contribute during their master's and phd thesis i said before fusion is an ecosystem challenge and in fact, like some of the uh, the academic results, like we were building on as a company, uh, comes from PhD student work. Um, so people are able with their master's PhD projects to contribute to that challenge. If one does this in an academic institution or directly with a company or in industry that is like supplying these companies, um, for me, it doesn't matter, right? You're all contributing to that uh, 
uh, to that goal. So I think it's not just education. And then uh, to the question of like, does one do a PhD or, is a, or, or directly a master's? Um, for me, a PhD is just more um, professional experience. Um, so I guess one would rather like uh, compare um, a PhD to three or four years industry experience. Um, so I think that is the, the comparison. And honestly, I, I would prefer industry experience at this point. Um, but that doesn't mean that, I mean, we also have a, a need for PhDs more specifically than also on the physics side. If one does more engineering, I think it's it's more, uh, uh, if one wants to contribute more to uh, in, in four or five years, uh, I think uh, directly looking for an industry position, I think after the master's in a more engineering job is, uh, I think the more efficient way, because I think the growth path is it's much, uh, much higher. Yeah. I, I guess from from Ambrogio's talk, we saw how many PhDs will be needed before <laughs> we can we can get it done. Okay, so I guess this is a nice conclusion uh, to, to 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 this topic. So we can, I guess we can open the discussion to to the audience. So please, if anybody has a question, you can either raise the hands or uh, write a question directly into into the chat. And uh, I, I, I've seen the message come up uh, very soon after we started talking. So I'm guess I so I guess I shall start with the question from from the chat, from from Lillian. Hi everyone, nice to nice to meet you. How AI are being applied in your projects? So I guess uh, AI is a kind of a hot topic uh, recently. Um, so is anybody um, somehow being uh, involved with AIs in the in in their companies? Um, if if you are then uh feel free to feel free to to talk and if not maybe just give your perspective on the on the topic as well yeah victor so yes uh, i would say that for ai is quite important and we want to leverage every you know, new technologies and to give a, a concrete example uh, for us stellar radio optimization is a you know, big topic there has been a lot of you know result uh, in the past from stellar radio studies and uh, we are using AI to build on those results and try to you know, use the opt existing optimized accelerator family to find new ones. And so one, one specific topic, for example, is the how to, for example, uh, parameterize uh, accelerators. Right now, the, the, the way we describe accelerators is very complicated and not every accelerator that we describe is a useful one. And so we're using AI to uh, try and only target useful accelerators that we that will yield essentially performant results. Right. I guess I guess that sums it up quite nicely. Anybody? Uh, anyone else wants to wants to add something? I, yeah. I want to uh, fully uh, in agreement with Victor. <laughs> I think AI will be important, but don't think AI will be the central thing that we it will solve all. When AI for the simulation for modeling and so on is important, but also all these uh, hardware things we, we have to develop uh, uh, magnet. We we are we are using AI to, to discuss the, the the magnet pattern and so on. But after that we have to build. And we need an engineer with hardware and is not a cool pianist and uh, on the keyboard. We will need material engineer, electrical engineer, mechanical engineer in, in the domain. This is also very important. And AI will be important. But all the engineering domain will be also important to build a, a, a fusion power plant on the grid. Okay, great. So uh, we are uh, running out of time. So uh, Yuri, just just quick, quick remark. Would you do you want to add something or? Uh, yeah, just quickly. I mean, uh, um, I slightly disagree that we have enough configurations, accelerator configurations out there. Uh, to train models on, we need to generate these uh, these databases. So we in Proxima, we have like 1 million Stellarator configurations in our database. We are building it up, but uh, that is something that uh, requires a certain architecture, certain structure. Uh, we're now hi hiring an AI team um, that is actually like building this uh, up in, uh, in, in, in Proxima, but uh, that will uh, be a, a focus in, in front of us. And this to Stellarator optimization. And then uh, another aspect that probably maybe, I don't know, uh, people don't consider that much is uh, um, AI is pretty good at uh, activating knowledge. And fusion is an interdisciplinary uh, field where many of the design challenges are interdisciplinary. And that requires like bringing different domain experts, different, different domain expertise together in order to curate like one systems aspect. And there like LLMs uh, can help a lot, I think, in, in the future, like curating that knowledge and bringing it to this, to this uh, 
to this focal point of uh, conceptualizing a certain uh, component or so. That I think is a very interesting uh, uh, stream that we will see in the future. Okay, great. So uh, Dario, do we have time, time for more questions or? I would propose to leave it to only one and one short because we have the speakers from the next sessions already ready. So yeah, one more, it's okay. Okay, so uh, the, the the first question I saw was a uh, raised hand from from Danny. So, if you have your any question, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think my question is more um, for Victor and Jorit because it's about the stellarator concept, and I wanted to ask you about your approach for for a breathing blanket for a future reactor because we know that. <laughs> For the stellarator concept is a bit of a problem when you have the breather between uh, your coils and the plasma. And, and yeah, I know from Renaissance Fusion, you will have the liquid wall, but I want some more information about how you will do it, how you will, uh, first, it, will it be activated somehow, your wall, and then how will you manage to recirculate the same amount of lithium that has turn into tritium and um, yeah that's my question yeah sorry before before you start the the answers let me just uh jump in a bit for 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 a quick remark uh we have another question in the chat uh and i guess you can answer it in the chat as well um uh, if you if you want to so so feel free feel free to do so now victor you're it please so well i i can start so as daniel was saying right now we're using a we're demonstrating thick liquid metal flow as a first uh, plasma uh, wall. And so uh, this is something that we're doing in the lab downstairs. And uh, we're also you know, right now putting a lithium in front of a neutron source to try and understand you know, the, the, the breeding of tritium and how we're going to do this uh, closed fuel cycle. Because as Frederick was saying, this is a critical part of any you know, steady state uh, fusion power plant. And so right now we are investigating different alloys of uh, lithium and lithium hydride in order to breed the tritium in a closed loop uh, and reduce also the inventory in the power plant. And I'll pass it over to, to Jorah. Um, so we are a little bit uh, more ambiguous, let's say, with our um, blanket concept at this point. Um, what's important for stellarator design is that you have a uh, a uh, certain distance between plasma and and coils, and there are many different uh, technologies that can can fill that gap. Uh, I personally find the immersion blanket that is being proposed by uh, CFS very interesting, uh, fitting it with mol molten salt uh, or um, liquid lithium lead uh, is an interesting concept. Although then you have to do the calculation with the back reaction to the field, and we know that the stellarator field is very dependent on these uh, small little errors. Um, but uh, the discussion is not yet concluded. Um, I don't see like why it intrinsically should be harder in a stellarator than in a tokamak. Um, you can optimize for stellarators where the coils are far enough away in order to, um, for them to still produce the error fields that you need. Um, of course, you need to like deal with these 3D geometries, but um, that's something manageable. Okay, thank you very much. And with that, uh... I would like to close the, the panel discussion now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks to the panelists mostly uh, for joining us today and to, to the audience as well for joining us and raising questions, very interesting questions as well. Thank you very much. And now I am uh, going to uh, tell, let Dario tell you more organizational stuff. Thank you very thank much. You very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Jan and all the speakers. Thank you so much for this interesting uh, panel discussion.